Good morning, and thank you for being here for day two. I'm Mark Godsey, director of the Ohio Innocence Project. Um, our third panel, which is the first for today, is starting points, lessons learned from creating and implementing best practices and conviction re review units in prosecutor's offices. Um, the, the moderator wasn't able to make it, but we have the three panelists. Uh, Lindsay, is it Geis? Geis. Geis Smith, executive director of the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. The Honorable Michael G. Nurheim from the state's attorney's office in Lake County, Illinois and then Beth Tanner, the Associate Director of the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. So we'll let you guys take it from here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to just start by telling you all a little bit about the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. Um, we are a state agency, and we are the only state agency uh, in the nation um, that is charged with doing a neutral investigation of post-conviction innocence claims. So we are very different um, than what everyone else has set up. Um, in North Carolina, to date, we don't have any conviction integrity units or conviction review units. Um, I think that is largely uh, because the state chose to implement uh, the commission model there. That so um, certainly individual prosecutors' offices could at some point decide that they want to do that as well. Um, when the General Assembly created us in 2006, they believed that the best way to handle post-conviction innocence claims was through a timely, independent, and neutral investigation of those claims. Um, they believed that this would ensure justice for not only the innocent, but also the guilty. Um, and so that's how we came into being. Uh, we began operation a year later in 2007. Um, and we are a neutral investigative agency. So our staff is made up of eight individuals who conduct investigations um, into these claims of innocence. As a staff, we don't ever represent defendants and we don't ever represent the prosecution. We simply seek to um, do a thorough investigation and uncover new, credible, verifiable evidence of innocence. So the statute sets out several um, criteria that we have to meet uh, in order to continue reviewing a claim. For example, the crime must have been a felony conviction in North Carolina State Court. So we don't look at any felony claims, I'm sorry, federal claims, or any out-of-state claims. We certainly get those requests regularly, but we are not able to look at those. Uh, the person also has to be claiming complete innocence of all aspects of the crime. So they cannot be claiming that um, they've been overcharged or overconvicted, um, that they had a lesser role in the crime that has to be um, all, all areas of the crime they have to be claiming innocence for. Um, so that's a little bit different as well. We also can't look at anything procedural. So your Brady issues and some of the things that we've heard um, you all talk about uh, yesterday, those are just not things that we, by statute, are given the authority to look into. Um, we are given a lot of authority within the statute to effectuate our investigations. The goal was for the commission to be able to get to the truth, um, whatever that was. And so by way of example, we're given the authority of the entire Criminal Procedure Act in North Carolina, which is Chapter 15A, and the entire Civil Procedure uh, chapter in North Carolina, which is Chapter 1A. So what that means is we can do things um, like depose individuals as if we were in a civil action, seek admissions, um, things of that nature. We can also do anything in our Criminal Procedure Act, including things like search warrants. Um, we have the outright ability to collect evidence from agencies and where agencies cannot find evidence or cannot provide some documentation that the evidence has been destroyed. We have the ability to request to go in um, and conduct a search on our own. Um, if there's any kind of pushback from that, we can seek a remedy from our chair, who is a superior court judge. 
In North Carolina, that is the highest trial court level. Um, and she sits as our chair in her judicial capacity and makes all decisions related to our access to evidence. Um, she doesn't always agree with us, <laughs> so there's no, um, you know, there's no, we, we don't really have a leg up with her, um, but she is the one responsible uh, for hearing all of those things. So we're not having to seek that from other judges who may not be familiar with the work of the commission. Um, we also have subpoena power, um, so we can subpoena individuals um, to, for depositions or to be present uh, before the commission uh, at our hearings. Our staff works on the investigations. So when claims come in, we do a review of that claim, and as long as they're meeting the statutory criteria, we continue to review the claim, trying to determine if there's new evidence of innocence, and then even when we find that new, trying to determine whether it's credible and verifiable. Um, I always give the example, if, you, if you're new, is that your mom is your alibi. That alone is not gonna be sufficient to make it through the commission. There's gonna have to be something else. Is there anything else that we can find that would make that alibi credible and verifiable? Um, the commission staff does not ever take an opinion on guilt or innocence. It is simply our job to uncover whatever is out there. And I tell people every day that that is the good, the bad, and the ugly. When defendants or convicted individuals decide to apply to the commission, they are agreeing to cooperate. Um, that includes waiving their procedural rights and privileges, such as their attorney-client privilege, doctor-patient, spousal, um, clergy, all of those things, and even their right against self-incrimination. So in order to participate in our process, at some point they're going to have to waive those rights. That means we're gonna go and talk to their defense attorney from trial. We're gonna find out if they ever admitted guilt um, or if they've always claimed innocence or if the attorney doesn't know because they didn't ask. Um, we're gonna get that information um, because again, the goal is to get to the truth, whatever that truth may be. Um, as cases move forward, uh, through the process. It's a lengthy process, um, depending on how far the claim gets. Uh, eventually, we move a case into what we call formal inquiry. Formal inquiry is set out in the statute and triggers notice to victims. So we very much uh, do not move cases into that formal inquiry piece until we know that there's something new and we've got some backing to that. Um, that is because we try to avoid revictimizing victims when we can. Um, and then our cases move into a commission hearing. And so just briefly, commission hearings are done before our eight member panel. Um, up until the point of the commission hearing, all of the work is done by the staff. And then we present them to the commissioners. The rules of evidence do not apply at our hearings. Um, it is very beneficial to us that that's the case because we may have interviewed upwards of 75 people in a case. Um, because we have to present everything, um, we're not picking and choosing which um, you know, individuals we want to put up. We're not advocates, so we're not kind of culling through that to decide who might be a better witness, that kind of thing. So we're able to have our staff testify to those interviews and only bring in the critical witnesses that may be provided that new information. Our commissioners are made up of eight uh, individuals, a superior court judge, who I've said is the chair, a defense attorney, a district attorney, which is a prosecuting attorney in North Carolina, a victim advocate, a sheriff, a member of the public who cannot be a lawyer, and two discretionary members. Um, and right now those discretionary members happen to be attorneys, though they are not criminal law attorneys. Um, they hear the case and then they make a finding as to whether there is um, sufficient evidence of innocence to merit judicial review. When they're making that finding, they're not deciding whether or not the person is innocent or guilty. They're simply saying there's something here that merits further review. And if they vote to put that case forward, it goes to what is a three-judge panel in North Carolina. That's a panel of three superior court judges that were not involved in the initial trial or any post-conviction proceedings. And 
Um, that is an adversarial proceeding. So up until this point, we've been non-adversarial, but when it gets to three-judge panel, the commission staff is not involved except that we may be subpoenaed to testify, and the statute provides that we will provide our file um, to the parties, and then they decide what they present. The burden is on the defendant to prove by clearing convincing evidence that he or she is in fact innocent. And um, so the courtroom's kind of opposite of what you normally think of in a trial. And um, the judges have to be unanimous in their decision. At any point in the process prior to the commission hearing, um, the commission can close the case uh, and dismiss it summarily in its discretion. Um, there's no right to appeal that decision. There's also no right to appeal the decision of the commissioners, and then there's no right to appeal the decision of the three-judge panel. So that's some background, and I think I will um, let Beth talk about some of the things that we have found um, that work for this model. Hey, everybody. Um, so I think when I started at the commission, I mean, from a lawyer's perspective, I think it's about the coolest thing ever to be like, hey, every tool that any lawyer in the state could use, you can use them all. Um, but I think that that's, it's, it's really just necessary to our ability for the model to work. So in addition to the fact that we have criminal procedure and that we have civil procedure, which, you know, this, what I find in the civil procedure is that's just a different way sometimes, sometimes a more expansive way to figure some things out in a case on occasion. We also are just given some very specific powers in the statute that Lindsay talked about. And I will say that all of those things together are truly necessary for us to move through an investigation. I think the other piece of that, though, is the fact that we are, by statute, you know, lawyers are advocates, right? That's what we're told to go be. But by statute, we're, we're not. We are, as a staff, told to be neutral. And because we don't ultimately end up at the three-judge panel representing either the state or the defendant, you know, I think one of the panelists said yesterday, you're always having to talk about think about, are you being neutral? Where are you coming from? We all have inherent biases. And those conversations happen in our office, right? Like we're sitting around talking about a case and we're stepping back and looking at it. But it helps us immensely, I believe, that we don't really have a dog in the outcome of this fight, right? Like we are just looking for the evidence and the truth in this case. But because we're given all those tools, the neutrality is really important, right? So when we're walking into a police department or a prosecutor's office, the fact that we are, in fact, neutral instead of an advocate helps us in talking with them about, hey, listen, I understand maybe you don't want us to come in your evidence room, but this is what we're going to do, and here's why. And that, that, I think, is really helpful to us. The other piece that I find to be really important, and I deal with this a lot every day, is our files are actually considered confidential up until a certain point, and that's even from the claimant. Um, so as I'm sure y'all are aware, that, that's helpful during the course of an investigation right anyway, right, that we have this confidential file. We're able to go forward with our investigation. But even the claimant um, is not entitled to know everything that's going on. At the point at which the case goes to a commission hearing, our statute very specifically provides for what will become public record. And what becomes public record is what is considered by the commission at the hearing and we do what's called a, a commission brief that kind of outlines what happened in the case before we got involved. So that'll become public. Um, I find that that is very helpful because the commission procedure is, it's said right in the statute that it's an extraordinary remedy. And it is. You can't really think of any place else where a defendant is coming to you and saying, I'm, I'm here. I've got my, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm giving up every right for you to come look at this case. And so the confidentiality piece becomes very important for that reason, right? Because defendants are giving up their rights. So if you think about our extraordinary remedy, that's fine for that purpose. But if you think about, you know, other litigation that may spawn from that, we do really stand behind the confidentiality of the file, except for use as the statute outlines. Um, I think the other piece to that, though, is that 
it allows us to have some really frank discussions and cases about what happened, you know what I mean? Um, and I think that's helpful. That's not to say that those items wouldn't ever be presented at a commission hearing, but it certainly is helpful to allow you to have an open conversation with the agency partners you're working with about a particular case. Um, the public record is, in any, in any of our cases, can be found on our website, so that's kind of how we do that. And of course, we have records retention policies about all of our files through the state, so I found that to be helpful. I think the last piece that's really important for me is the chair, being able to manage the issues that we face. Um, I find myself, and Lindsay finds herself frequently in cases because the chair is in charge of those issues within the confines of an open investigative case. So when we have a case open, the chair is handling those challenges to our access to evidence, which can come in all kinds of forms. So that's not just, for example, a challenge, a police department might say, hey, listen, you're not coming in my evidence room to pick up my evidence. That's not the only challenge we're talking about. We may believe that, for example, the Department of Public Safety has a ton of documentation information that we need, like educational records or mental health records about a defendant. And they may feel like they need to be heard in front of the judge for some reason. So that that is, we do a lot of kind of here in front of the judge. But that's super important for us because in instances where the chair may not have jurisdiction over an issue, it takes some real effort to educate courts about, hey, this is who we are and this is what we're doing and this is why it's really important that you keep my records confidential or you, you know, understand how my process works. So I think that is a really important piece that within the investigative cases, um, the chair is the one making those decisions. And Lindsay's right, she doesn't, she definitely doesn't always agree with us, <laughs> so um, that's how it works. I don't think there's anything else. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Nierheim. I'm the uh, elected state's attorney from Lake County, Illinois. Lake County, if you're not familiar, we're about halfway between Chicago and uh, Milwaukee. Um, I, you know, I, I come with sort of the perspective from what I would describe as a small to medium-sized prosecutor's office uh, with no budget for, for these types of initiatives. So my office is about 140 people, about half are lawyers. Um, Lake County is a little over 700,000 in population. We have some urban areas, we have agricultural, uh, you, you, know, you name it, we have it. Um, incredibly diverse community. Uh, in Lake County, going back to when I ran for office in, in 2011 into 2012, had a reputation nationally uh, with regard to wrongful convictions. There was a series of cases that had gone back uh, 20 some years, four cases uh, that had that were the subject of a lot of media attention. Um, and that was an issue in the election. And I, I give my community a lot of credit because back then, 2010, 2011, 2012, you know, the concept of criminal justice reform wasn't necessarily as uh, popular as it is today. But my community demanded answers for this. And you know, my background, I had been an assistant state's attorney for a number of years. I've been a criminal defense attorney for, for a few years. And uh, when I ran for office, I was coming at it from sort of both perspectives. And back then, I, I looked around the country and, and was looking for models because I wanted to create some form of conviction review in, in my office. Um, and at the time, I, I was just kind of neat to be here with, with my friends from North Carolina because uh, at the time I could find North Carolina and I could find Dallas, Texas. And uh, I know there were other models uh, around the country at the time, but those were the only two that I uh, was able to find. And I kind of looked at both and took what I thought were some of the pros uh, with regard to both and, and melded them together and, and create uh, created what I call our case review panel. What I liked a lot about the North Carolina model was the fact that it has this diverse group of commissioners. Uh, as you heard, you know, uh, you have a defense advocate, you have a victim advocate, prosecutor, defense attorney. Um, I, I really like that because kind of dovetailing on some of the discussion we had yesterday, when you look at what is likely one of the main causes of wrongful convictions, that tunnel vision, that cognitive bias that we all experience, uh, uh, you know, in accepting that and then trying to determine, well, what's the best way to deal with that? What's the best way to overcome that tunnel vision? 
And I think the best way to do that is to bring some independent, independent fresh eyes to cases um, because tunnel vision is human nature. We all do it. And I thought in an office as small as mine, uh, where everybody knows each other and everybody uh, has relationships with, with each other, uh, it's hard to have truly independent, unbiased review of each other's cases because you know, you, you know each other. You've worked together for years. You might socialize together on the weekends, and you're going into that review biased. Uh, I think it's some of these bigger metropolitan offices, uh, completely in-house review, uh, it definitely works. But in smaller, mid-sized offices, um, I think you still have that challenge of bias. And also coupled with the fact that I didn't have a budget to create an in-house conviction integrity unit. So uh, what I created was this case review panel where I went out and I found people to volunteer their time uh, to sit on this panel. So I have uh, civil rights lawyers, uh, civil attorneys, criminal defense attorneys, retired judges, uh, people from outside of my community that they're sworn in as special assistant state's attorneys, but again, it's a volunteer. Uh, they meet, uh, we actually don't even meet in my office. We meet off-site at a, at a defense attorney's office that lets us use their space. And they review cases that are brought in uh, or we're asked to review uh, claims of action innocence. That model has uh, sort of evolved through the years and, and what I found was, um, well, it's great to have that review uh, from that independent body. Sometimes as these cases come in, I found myself needing help in organizing the cases and in, in, in sort of putting things together for the panel because I was meeting directly with the panel and uh, you know these, these some of these cases were coming in that were over 20 years old. So there was sort of a lot of legwork that had to be done to get things together. So I found myself tasking people in my office, in addition to their normal caseload, some of the more experienced felony prosecutors, to uh, help with the review. And I was quite, uh, I won't say surprised, but I was pleased to see how they were really uh, kind of taken to this. And uh, they sort of formed their own in-house conviction integrity unit, which was in addition to their own caseload. So we formalize that process a little bit where they are working independent of the case review panel, but kind of parallel. So they're reviewing cases alongside the panel, but there's really no interaction between the two. And uh, we took that a, a step further about a year and a half ago and brought in uh, Mike Melius, who's here today. Mike is a lifelong criminal defense attorney. He was the public defender in, in our county and worked for uh, I won't call him out, but somewhere between 30 and 40 years as a criminal defense attorney and never been a prosecutor in his life, decided to retire. And I thought, here's an opportunity to, to bring somebody in to oversee this whole unit that has uh, you know, no prosecution history whatsoever, uh, that can come in with complete fresh eyes, complete independence, and help oversee that unit. Uh, and he's done an outstanding job. It was kind of interesting yesterday when uh, Russell asked prosecutors to raise their hand and I was curious to see if Mike would raise his hand, and he did. So he's, he's been converted to a prosecutor. Um, but it's neat to see uh, those units working together. And, uh, and I think there's a lesson there that, you know, when I, I travel around my state to try to encourage other communities to uh, develop these types of panels, and we all suffer from the same budgetary restrictions. We all suffer from the same staff shortages. Uh, but these units can be put together uh, without necessarily a huge budgetary uh, commitment from, from your county. Uh, we're hoping to evolve to have some more full-time people as part of the panel. Um, I'm sorry, as part of the in-house unit. We do have a part-time investigator that is a retired FBI agent that came on board to help us review cases, and it's nice to have that because he has, uh, again, you know, trying to, to uh, eliminate any possibility of bias. He's not you know, he doesn't have relationships with any of the law enforcement officers that may have investigated these cases initially or any of us. So it's, it's just, there, there's a lot of effort on our part to bring in people to help us review these cases that really have no relationship uh, whatsoever with the initial prosecution. So with that, I'll look forward to questions. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll sort of act as a moderator and ask a few questions to start off. Um, so, with the North Carolina Innocence Commission, so this is the only commission that's an independent agency that I know of in the United States, right? Correct. So in England, they have one like that called the CCRC, and they also have one in Norway. And in both the UK and Norway, um, the Innocence Projects there 
um, complain a lot about those commissions and they say that it's just like you know trying to move a glacier and they don't really function that well. I don't hear that about North Carolina. Um, from the Innocence Projects in North Carolina. Have you studied the, the CCRC and the one in Norway? Do you know if, why yours seems to be functioning in a way that um, is satisfying more audiences? So I have not, mainly because of time. <laughs> um, and I, I, I appreciate that that is the feedback that you have gotten. We believe that that is the feedback. I mean, that's what we hear as well. That, um, And we believe that the Innocence Projects and the Innocence Commission can both function um, in our state. They, they look at things a little bit differently than we do. They handle some issues that we just aren't allowed to handle uh, with the statutory um, kind of limits that we have, um, some of the Brady issues, some of the more procedural errors that come up that kind of go hand in hand with the Innocence. So what happens in North Carolina Carolina is we get a good bit of referrals from the Innocence Projects or the law school um, uh, wrongful conviction clinics that we have in North Carolina, um, usually when they kind of get to a point where they can't do anything else. Um, one of the differences with the commission and the post-conviction um, motion for appropriate release pro relief process is that for post-conviction DNA testing outside of the commission, you have to get a court order for that. And there's several um, requirements that you have to meet in order to uh, be able to obtain that order. Through the commission process, we have that kind of outright ability to DNA test or other forensic testing without any other kind of criteria. As long as your case meets the commission's criteria and there is evidence that could show innocence, we can test that. And we've been fortunate to receive a um, NIJ grant since 2010 and just received it again um, this year for that post-conviction DNA testing piece. Um, I'll add, because we've talked a little bit about budgets, our state budget is about $570,000 a year um, for six full-time staff and then all of the work we do. The NIJ grant that we get is about $575,000 for a two-year period. So it adds a substantial amount of money for those two positions and then all of the DNA testing that we do um, comes out of that grant, but it gives us the flexibility to be able to test where other people can't get that testing done. Okay. And another question I had about your commission, you said you're looking at only um, sort of abstract innocence and not like Brady or other things. So what if it comes into you in the form of a Brady violation? I know you won't go forward as that as, that as the ground of relief, but many times a Brady violation can lead to an investigation that then demonstrates innocence. So do you stop and you go, oh, Brady violation, we, don't, we won't go any further, or you just say, okay, we're not looking at it as a procedural, we're just gonna continue now investigating this alternate suspect. Right. that was hidden or something like that. Right, so there's a little bit of a misnomer that when someone applies to the commission, they have to articulate what the new evidence would be. Sometimes um, individuals are able to do that, but in cases um, where they're not, and maybe they give us the Brady violation or something else, as long as when I look at that case, I can see that there might be something that we could pursue that would be an actual innocence claim, then we're gonna keep that open. Another thing is, it, even if we were to reject a case, say, because we didn't see anything new right that minute, people can reapply. There's no bar to reapplying if something new comes up later. Um, and we've had that happen. Um, maybe, you know, there was nothing at the time. People, sometimes we get these claims two months after someone has pled guilty or, or been convicted, and, and it's going to be hard to find new in that moment. Um, but that doesn't mean that a few years later that there's not a recanting witness that wasn't recanting two months after the trial um, or something like that. So they're always able to reapply and we'll take another look and just see if there's anything there. We're also required to turn over evidence of wrongdoing. Part of our statute, you know, our files are confidential, but we have some required points. So we are required to turn over any evidence that we might uncover, like say during the course of an investigation of any kind of really misconduct. Um, and that's also wrongdoing. So I mean, if we come across some other crime that somebody committed, we're gonna report that too. So we do kind of have that piece of it is sort of open to us, our requirements. Do you report an effective assistance of counsel by defense counsel and Brady violations by police or prosecutors? So if it's very clear, then we do. Um, I don't know that that we've had an ineffective assistance situation that we were able to report. Brady violations, if we know, um, 
if we're able to obtain the defense attorney's file and then we're able to obtain the, the full prosecution's file, we at least let the claimant or their attorney know, hey, this, you know, this might have been missing from what was turned over. We don't necessarily draw the conclusion that there is a Brady violation. Okay. So my next question, I guess, is two parts. Um, the first part is, how long has your, each of your organizations been in existence and sort of what are your stats? Like you reviewed this many cases and this is how many we've sought an exoneration. Um, and then if you could, I mean, we've, we've talked about your models and how they operate sort of in the abstract. If it's possible, could you take us through one of your cases of exoneration and just describe how it worked? All right, I'll start. Uh, so we've been in existence since uh, 2013. We've had four exonerations. Uh, we initially had, uh, uh, it was interesting. I thought we would have really a flood of people uh, asking to have their cases reviewed. And when we put this thing out there, because outside of Cook County, which is Chicago, there's really no other conviction integrity unit that I'm aware of in Illinois. Um, I know there's a couple counties that are in the process of developing them, but um, you know, it was really a new, uh, a new program when it was launched. And I expected the floodgates to open. And we really didn't see that. In fact, because we didn't see that, uh, we would take really any case. So we had um, felonies, misdemeanors, we had people writing in basically indicating that, well, you know, I may have done it, but my sentence was a little too high. Um, you know, those are cases now that we wouldn't accept. I mean, we will accept, we don't have a restriction in terms of felony or misdemeanor, um, but we do require there to be some claim of actual innocence. And we have formalized our process. Um, one of the cases that we did uh, exonerate was a DNA exoneration, and it's it's an interesting story because uh, it, it highlights a lot of different issues, uh, and a lot of the issues that were discussed yesterday with regard to identification and, and you know whether the prosecutor that handled the initial prosecution can or should be part of the review, um, and then what do you do after you find that there's an exoneration? And um, you know one of the things we do is is sort of a sentinel review where where we will pick that case apart and then we will conduct a training in-house uh, for all of our staff to determine you know, what went wrong here, how did this happen, and most importantly, how can we prevent these things from happening in the future? And that's another component of, of our case review process that I initially neglected to talk about. It's a very important component is the, the training and prevention aspect. But this was a DNA case, uh, goes back 22 years, where an individual, uh, a, a woman had been uh, sexually assaulted by two individuals. One was caught, the other was not. There's no doubt that this crime uh, did in fact happen. Uh, the individual that was caught uh, gave a confession. Uh, there was DNA that did not exclude the defendant, but this is over 20 years ago, so the, the science had not evolved to anywhere near that it was uh, today. Uh, and she, there was an identification through a show-up procedure. So you had uh, DNA that does not exclude the defendant. You have um, an identification, you have a confession, uh, and some other uh, evidence that corroborated the identification. So it was, in all respects, uh, a decent case. Case went to trial, the defendant was convicted, sentenced. Uh, some years after the trial, the defense in the case asked uh, my office, prior to me taking over, if the office would agree to retest the DNA. The office at the time objected to that test. Uh, the, the, went to court, the court ordered uh, a test of the DNA. Um, the DNA test came back and showed a partial, uh, or an unknown male profile, not the defendant. Um, in the DNA sample that had been collected at the time. The theory, I guess, when that came back was, okay, well, that second unknown male profile could be the other offender that was not caught. Doesn't mean that the person that was convicted is innocent, so they sort of moved on. When I became elected, uh, I was contacted, asked to review that case again, asked if we would agree to retest the DNA a second time. Our our policy is we do not object uh, to any request to retest DNA. So, uh, of course, we work to uh, get that test done. Uh, the test showed now, uh, and again, as DNA continued to evolve, uh, now we had two unknown male profiles, neither of which were the defendant. So uh, we acted immediately. We, this is a case we work with the New York Innocence Project. Uh, and as this test came back, you know, we worked immediately to, uh, to free that person. Um, and, and I'll say that the trial attorney that had that case initially was part 
pretty instrumental in the review of that case. And this case actually never ended up going through the case review panel because it was a DNA case. And once we had that DNA test, I didn't need to send this to my panel to get their opinion. I knew, I knew what we were going to do, so we acted immediately. But that prosecutor was involved in that process. Um, and I, there was something very powerful when he actually did that Sentinel review training for our staff. He presented it. And to stand up there and to, to train the whole staff on, this is a case I prosecuted. These are the facts I had at the time. Uh, but this is how facts have changed, and this is, this is what happened. Uh, and for him to do that was uh, probably difficult, but he believed 100% in that exoneration. Um, and, and it just shows how, how scary these cases can be, because with that set of facts, mm -hmm. if you were to go back 22 years and present that case to any prosecutor in the room, I think we'd all prosecute that case and try it. Uh, but we've learned a lot through the years. So. Um, <coughs> Lots of lessons there, lots of lessons in particular for young prosecutors when it comes to what do we do with identification, what do we do with identification processes, what do we do when you have a, a full confession. Uh, this was a full confession on video that was not too terribly long. I think the entire interrogation was uh, four hours. Um, and even that uh, was not a true confession. So it, it, like I said, lots of lessons there. And, and that's why it's important when we do find these cases that we pick them apart and uh, learn everything that we can from them. How about, how about you guys for stats and make a story? Sure. Um, so the commission began operation in 2007. As of October 1st this year, we've had 2,488 claims. Um, we have now closed 2,420 of those. And when I say closed, that can include it's gone all the way through the process. But that leaves about... Um, 68 open claims right now. Um, we have had um, 12 hearings since uh, 2007, and we've had 10 exonerations um, as the result of the commission's work. Um, those 10 exonerations, some of those were co-defendant cases, so we might have had two individuals exonerated from one hearing, and a couple of those hearings actually weren't through the commission. Um, so this is a little bit unique because um, Occasionally, there comes a time where we turn over information to the district attorney. For example, in a single perpetrator rape case where um, the victim has not had um, sex with anyone, and so we're, we're talking about if it's not that person's DNA, then they're not the perpetrator. Um, we believe that that will often trigger that requirement to turn over information to the prosecutor as soon as we have those results, because that means there's someone else out on the streets, potentially. Um, when we've done that in those cases, the district attorney has often decided to take action on their own outside of the commission process by filing a motion for appropriate relief um, and getting that taken care of at, in the one I'm thinking of in about three days. We just had a weekend and they had a hearing on the district attorney's motion, which in North Carolina is very rare uh, for the district attorney to file that. Um, so some of those come from there. It was the commission's work, but it didn't go all the way through the commission process. Um, we typically have most of our claims come from the violent felonies. Um, homicides, uh, sex offenses, and robberies are our three most common. Um, we do look at other claims as well, um, but all of our exonerations um, have resulted uh, after convictions for those higher level felonies. To talk about a case, um, Let's see. Um, I'll actually talk about a 2008 rape. So this is fairly recent. Um, it was the rape of a 12-year-old girl. Um, she was walking home from school one day, had just departed, kind of parted ways with her friends. Her sister had gone ahead, and she was pulled into an abandoned home um, just about maybe half a mile, if that, from her home. And she was raped. Um, she reported that she had never had sex before. Um, she reported that she wasn't sure whether the perpetrator used a condom or not. There was some serology screening at the time by our crime lab, and since they didn't see um, semen or sperm, they didn't proceed with any type of testing on her clothing or on the uh, rape kit. 
They did have a hair that they compared uh, microscopically, and they said that it was microscopically consistent with the defendant. Fortunately, before trial, they did send that to a lab in Connecticut that was doing mitochondrial DNA testing at the time, and it came back as consistent with the victim, the 12-year-old girl, not the 40-year-old man. Um, that was in 2008. Um, the victim also was walking uh, the day after the crime to a friend's house and saw um, the defendant on the porch of another home and screamed, that's him. Um, told her friend, that's him. Um, they went to him and said, hey, will you come to the house? This is the neighbors went and said, come to this house. Um, he walked to the home of the victim, and when he got almost to the home, she began screaming and crying. And so he took off running um, and ran to his, his, where he was living, just a couple of blocks away. Um, he was arrested, of course, um, and eventually took a plea. Um, he was told by his attorney that if he were to go to trial, she would get on the stand and say that it was him and that he had no chance of winning. So he took a very good plea uh, to five years plus five years post-release supervision. Um, he was looking at over 20 years uh, for that crime. Um, when the case came to the commission, we conducted a lot of DNA testing. Um, we started with the rape kit. Um, there was no DNA on the vaginal swabs. Um, it's probably an indicator that the perpetrator wore a condom. Um, we also then began testing her clothing. And the reason we did that is because she had described how the perpetrator had pulled off her pants and underwear. And so we looked for touch DNA on the waistband of her pants and underwear. Um, there were also some stains on her uh, pants that later were determined to um, have sperm. And what we got, we ended up having to do YSTR testing um, because there was going to be so much victim that would have masked the male there. Uh, we got partial profiles from each of those areas. Those profiles where there were um, alleles in common um, or lo loci in common, um, they were consistent profiles among the various um, stains and touch DNA. So that was um, presented to the commission. Um, they voted unanimously to send that case forward to a three-judge panel. At that three-judge panel, the parties agreed to provide the commission, the transcript from the commission hearing, um, and the information that we had presented to our commissioners to the three judges in advance. And then they joined in a motion requesting that the three-judge panel um, ultimately exonerate Mr. Brown. Um, in that particular case, the three-judge panel wanted some evidence on the record, um, some testimony, so they called commission staff to testify about our investigation and ultimately voted unanimously that Mr. Brown um, was innocent. Um, I guess now we take questions. Good morning. Thanks for coming out. Um, my question is to the commission. In that case you just described with Mr. Brown, can you tell us, I believe I thought I heard you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you do not accept uh, guilty pleas to the commission? We do accept guilty pleas. Okay. Can you walk us through then, in that particular case, how is it that, who all investigates the case? Is it just the commission? I think you said there's a number of people on the commission. Just walk the crowd through that, please. Sure. Um, so that case was investigated by commission staff. Um, it actually was investigated by me um, when I, before I was director, um, uh, I was hired as a, a staff attorney. So most of our staff is made up of attorneys who also are investigators. Uh, we do have an investigator position um, currently. Um, that individual happens to have a law degree, but it was licensed in another state, so he's not actively <laughs> licensed in North Carolina. Uh, but he also has an investigative background, a military investigative background. Um, so it is the staff that does the investigations. Um, 
mostly the attorney investigators um, that are out in the field. Beth and I also, uh, being a small staff, we also are doing the investigations in addition to our day-to-day -day, um, management duties and, and things of that nature. So it's really a team effort, um, but we send our staff to trainings um, on investigation, like investigation techniques, um, interview techniques, um, deposition training. Um, we have certified evidence custodians on staff because our statute allows us to take the evidence from the agency. We have our own evidence room and then we ship that to um, typically to private labs but also sometimes to our state crime lab depending on the type of testing that we're looking at doing. And as it relates to guilty pleas, when we're reviewing those, we have we have a statute, but we also have rules. The commission can promulgate rules, and it has. It is what was reasonably available at the time of plea, um, whereas with a trial, it would be what was presented at trial or at a post-conviction motion for appropriate leave or hearing. Can I ask you? Uh Oh, yeah. Regarding the waivers of attorney-client privilege, spousal privilege, medical privileges, we know that uh, many of the people who are exonerated are not exactly upstanding citizens otherwise. And the concern is where do you set up boundaries when it comes to investigating cases, finding information that was given as a result of the waiver of the privilege, and then subjecting them to perhaps other criminal charges. So the waiver of the privilege is just for the case um, that the commission is reviewing. Uh, so they do have the benefit of counsel when they enter that waiver. Um, they're appointed counsel if they're deemed indigent, which most of these individuals are still incarcerated and are. Though we can look at cases where people are no longer incarcerated. Um, so yes, so the waiver is just to that piece. Um, if we uncover other evidence of other crimes through our own investigation, outside of like what we would receive from a defense attorney or um, some other privilege that was waived, then that's what we turn over. But not if there's something in that waived material um, that's not related to this crime, if that makes sense. It makes sense, but it also really uh, causes or, or requires some restraint, doesn't it, on the investigator? I don't actually know that we've ever received anything um, outside of what we've requested specific to this crime with the waivers. Um, we tell the defense attorneys, and that's the biggest piece, right, the defense file. We tell them that it is solely for this crime. Um, they have an opportunity to go through um, but we've definitely had the conversation in our office if something else were to come in that weren't related to this crime. That waiver is only for what's related to the crime at hand. You know, I would just add somewhat related to that. We don't have waivers, but we do receive a lot of direct communication from people uh, that are incarcerated or uh, contacting us without counsel. And we've evolved our process to the first thing we do is we reach back out to those people because I think this was addressed yesterday too. Uh, some of these folks may not necessarily know that they're communicating with prosecutors. So uh, we make it very clear uh, that they are and we suggest that they contact us through counsel. Uh, we also recommend uh, various innocence project groups around us and nationally that they uh, that they contact us through. You mentioned going to. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned going to trainings on uh, interviewing witnesses, and I was just curious because there's always a whole other slew of problems that come with super old cases. And so, have you found any specific trainings that you thought provide extra guidance with in relation to? Um, investigating old cases. And then the second thing is I'm embarrassed to say I haven't looked before to see if all of your uh, forms and such are online at your website, but your waiver or your procedures and all of that, is that anywhere that's accessible if somebody wanted to try and uh, evolve some sort of statewide organization like that? So that's so for the first part with the trainings, 
you know, I don't know that we've ever been able to find something specific to the old cases. We have definitely done some of the like NIDA trainings, which have been very helpful, particularly for skills. Of course, a lot of these skills are being taught by trial lawyers. So one of the conversations that Lindsay and I have with sending staff to this is you have to be aware that, you know, you're not picking one side or the other. Um, it's still certainly helpful for them to understand. I mean, I, I'll say this is kind of a funny anecdote. Like these great trainings are great. And one of the questions I have is, okay, so um, how does this interview look? Um, on the front steps of somebody's trailer amongst the beer cans um, while their mama is screaming at them in the back. I'm just curious how we're going to do that because obviously it's just a little bit different. So some of that is just kind of, you know, on the job. I don't know that we've ever found anything very specific. Um, as to the forms, we don't have any of our forms on, on the website. Nonetheless, they are public records, um, the empty forms themselves. So of course, you know, if somebody were to reach out to us, we would give that. I think part of the reason that we don't do that is because if ever we update the forms, you know, we want the forms, we kind of hold them, not that other people can't see them or share the ideas, right, amongst the community, but we want to make sure that what we're sending out to the defendants is the one we expect them to fill out and that people aren't pulling them and being like, hey, fill this form out. And we're like, oh, wait, that was two years ago. <laughs> you know, we have this one now. But they certainly, it's a public record because we're a state agency and the ones that aren't filled out are public. I guess I think I'm next. Hey, um, you mentioned the phrase innocence of all areas of the crime. How is that defined? And then just more specifically, I just didn't know if your statute like actually defines it. And uh, what I really wanted to know is, is there a differential, you know, do you differentiate between conduct that happened, so let's say, it, let's just call it the crime as kind of discrete conduct versus conduct that may have happened, you know, during let's say the fallout of, you know, this person becoming a defendant. Does that make sense? Do you, do you differentiate? Start with that. You understand what I'm asking? Sure, I do understand. So um, my favorite book of all time in my job is the NC Crimes book. Um, so of course, yes. And Lindsay and I have a lot of these conversations. She'll talk a little bit. She's got the statute pulled up about exactly what the statute says. But we have these conversations constantly. So because one of the questions that happens is, I mean, listen, if, if you're like, hey, I didn't do any part of this crime, but I, I drove the getaway car. I mean, there's just case law in North Carolina that talks about your level of participation in a crime and whether that puts you you as a certain type of participant in the crime. But there are also questions that come in our office and we, we talk about these. These are hard questions about whether the crime, the defendant was involved in some other crime that was done before the rest of this thing happened, right? Like, um, I'm trying to think about a good example, but maybe like you go in, you're, you're involved in some kind of robbery and y'all, y'all leave, you're, you're done, you know, and it, an hour later, one of the three of you goes back and commits a rape. I mean, we have to look into those questions. Those are just tough questions. Um, I'm not going to pretend like they're not. They're tough questions that we have to ask. And we really do, we do sit back on the case law, you know, and the statutory law in North Carolina about the crimes and how that would define it. You know, we have a felony murder rule that, murder rule that might make it kind of easy, but in some cases it's not quite as easy. Well, more specifically, after. So, so that's done, but now that I'm a defendant, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I may lie or conceal evidence or whatever. Do you differentiate in that sense? Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, I understand. So, so, I'm so saying they committed I, a crime. Or no, I'm saying I did not. I had no part in this murder, but now I'm being prosecuted for it. So, so to protect myself from being convicted in the first place, I may commit crimes like perjury. Right, so they cannot have had any involvement in the crime themselves, the underlying, the, crime. the underlying crime. So in North Carolina, what I would say about that is, I think it depends on what their later involvement was. If they were after the fact concealing evidence, there's some case law and statutory law that would provide that they are in fact a participant in the crime. It just, it's very fact dependent. So that's kind of a tough question to answer. I do understand what you're saying. If it's a separate crime, I think we can talk about, we talk about that and whether we can look at that piece. So to answer your question about the statute, um, it defines claim of factual innocence as a claim on behalf of a living person convicted of a felony in the General Court of Justice of the State of North Carolina, asserting the complete innocence of any criminal responsibility for the felony for which the person was convicted and for any other reduced level of criminal responsibility relating to the crime and for which there is some credible, verifiable evidence of innocence that has not previously been presented at trial or considered at a hearing granted through post-conviction relief. 
Um, so that's probably a little more clear as to what I meant earlier. Both models are very interesting, uh, but they're also very precarious for the applicant defendant. So I'm, I'm wondering, most of the prosecutors in the room probably have had some review process of distant cases in the past, whether it's the DNA applications or, or whatever, and have come up with confirmation or other evidence that actually shows that the person did in fact commit the crime. And there's another side of the equation, the victim and the victim's family. So what happens with those scenarios when you actually find out, okay, this person, although they've applied and they've said that they're innocent, we now actually know that there's more DNA that actually says he was there, or we've actually confirmed that the victims aren't recanting, or other pieces of information that would tend to corroborate. You mentioned uh, that this is public information. Does that get disseminated? Does that uh, uh, go to the defendant? Does it go to the prosecutor? Does that, uh, what happens with that? And then w what's been your experience with those cases that have been reviewed, but actually been found to be true, to, you know, uh, from then, do you have uh, further claims, or does it kind of just put an end to the uh, to the applicant who's been saying all along, you know, I actually was innocent, and now you know that they weren't. So what happens there? I, I'm asking both Illinois and North Carolina. Thank you. Sure. So for us, we it just puts an end to our review, um, and this reminds me of a. Uh, a pretty bad rookie mistake that I made when I first created this panel where uh, we were reviewing a series of cases. The Chicago Tribune was interested in what we were doing. They asked which cases we were reviewing. And in an effort to be transparent, I gave them the names of the cases that we were reviewing. And of course, uh, the victims in those cases uh, were, we had people calling in and, and we were unnecessarily causing those people and their families uh, a lot of grief, which I take responsibility for doing it. was a really stupid thing to do. Um, so now what we do is we don't uh, contact victims uh, unless we're pretty far along in the process. And, and if it looks like it's going to be an exoneration, then uh, I will personally have that conversation with somebody. That's not something I put on my staff to do. That's something I'll do. Uh, but if it's a, and that's when there's going to be an exoneration. Uh, when there's not, we don't contact the victims. We, they, they don't even know that we're reviewing the case unless, you know, again, it's going to result in an exoneration just because we don't want to drum up any necess unnecessary uh, feelings or emotions or any of that stuff. So it just sort of puts an end to the review. So, I think um, I think you mentioned that um, the records are public. For us, they're not. They're actually confidential, except when the case is at that commission hearing. But by then, we've notified a victim. Um, so with respect to cases, though, that close, really in, in a DNA case um, where we have confirmed guilt, we will let the defendant typically know that we have confirmed guilt. We also have, because they sign an affidavit of innocence under oath, we then have a duty to let the prosecutor know that we have confirmed guilt, um, because that is, they've technically committed perjury at that point. Um, to that end, to date, no prosecutor has proceeded with the perjury, but we do make them aware of that. Um, <coughs> otherwise, it's a little bit more difficult um, we don't, you know, if a witness is just not recanting that you've, that someone has said is recanting, we're not giving that information back and saying that that's necessarily a confirmation of guilt. Um, we've really just kind of reserved that to those DNA cases that are very clear. Otherwise, we are simply sending a letter to the defendant, I think this was discussed on the panel yesterday, that doesn't provide a lot of reason for why your case is being closed. It's more generic um, to just say we've completed our review and your case has been closed. Um, so in that way, we are um, reporting where there is some definitive evidence um, that there is guilt and that they've committed that perjury after signing that form, um, but otherwise we're not. But then what happens with that information? The prosecutor requests it. There may be other forms where the defendant is still arguing you know, uh, or a public review on a case or something. So what happens, I'm sorry, what happens then yeah. with that information? Not just the we've confirmed it letter, but the detail. Yeah, so um, 
our, as Lindsay said, our statute is, says that our file is confidential. And then what it says is we're required to report the favorable evidence. We're required to report evidence of wrongdoing. And then we're also required to turn over our entire file for purposes of the three-judge panel. If a prosecutor's office, if we contacted them and said, hey, listen, we tested this rape kit. It's a one, you know, single perpetrator rape. It's definitely this guy. You know what I mean? Like, this is what we found out. He signed this. If they decided they wanted to do something with that, or let's say we determined it was some other guy, not the defendant, and of course the prosecutor's office is probably then going to want to investigate it, right? Like the police department, they've got some unknown profile. We then produce our file to them pursuant to a protective order. We do use a protective order um, because the statute is very clear that except in those instances, you know, the file is confidential except for that public record piece after the hearing. So even when we're reporting the favorable evidence, we'll report it, but for you to get the documents, we do put in a protective order. What that protective order is going to say is that the prosecutor or the appropriate authorities can use that file for their purpose in investigating the crime. Question. <clears throat> yes. Two-part question. One is, since you both, both groups uh, have the burden of going to explain to the victim or victims that there's going to be an exoneration. Mike, I'm curiously interested about your case 22 years ago. Uh, tell and explain to the audience, because we have a mixed audience of community uh, people, defense attorneys, and prosecutors, what that process is all about. So we'll, we'll bring the person in for a uh, face-to-face -face meeting and we'll sit down and when I say we I mean me and uh, we'll let them know what happened and why and it's not a pleasant or a, certainly a fun thing to do but uh, it's our responsibility to do that and in that particular case that victim uh, be, for a lot of reasons and this gets into why uh, it's these changes in the identification process are so critical um, you know was not at all happy with my decision but you know it's 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 something we have to do. So. Um, so we, as we said, have that requirement when uh, the case moves into formal inquiry to notify the victim. Uh, we also have the requirement to notify the victim of any decision by the commission. At the three-judge panel, that, that notification is on the district attorney's office. Um, but for our purposes, we reach out to the victim. Uh, and we let them know that the case has been moved into formal inquiry. We explain what that is, and we allow them to decide how much they want to interact with us or not. We've also um, been providing them with some resources. Um, for example, the district attorney's office, they're equipped with victim witness um, legal assistance who can walk victims through stuff. Um, also, our attorney general's office kind of has a victim protection section, um, so we'll give them that information as well. We have been fortunate um, to date that most of the victims that we have interacted with, um, while maybe not liking what we're doing, um, have understood the commission's role. Um, for a lot of those victims, they have wanted to be a part of the process. They've wanted to ask a lot of questions about what we do. For others, they want to just sit back and wait um, until the case moves forward. Um, so we are not, um, obviously, victim advocates, and we don't have those resources in our office. We've just been tasked by the statute with giving that notification, but we try very hard um, to give them support um, through other means that they may need. I find it very interesting that even after a guilty plea, that you would be inclined to investigate to determine whether or not there was actual innocence, number one. But number two, it seems that North Carolina is so far ahead of most other states in the union insofar as conviction integrity is concerned that I'd like to know if you have an answer as to how this came about. How did the state legislature decide that this was an issue they wanted to address, and how could this be replicated in other jurisdictions? Sure. Initially, um, former Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, I. Beverly Lake, 
put together a study commission um, to look at wrongful convictions, what some of the causes were. Um, this would have been in early to mid uh, 2000s. And what came out of that study commission were largely three things. One, um, the um, lineups in North Carolina are now done uh, with sequential double blind lineups. Um, and so um, that was one piece. The other piece that came out um, was the recording of interrogations for certain level felonies. So your higher level violent felonies are all, those interviews and interrogations are all now recorded. And then the third piece was the creation of the commission. So that um, actual innocence commission uh, that was studying those things was made up again of individuals from all the different areas of the criminal justice system. Um, and they put forth the legislation uh, for the creation of the commission. Um, it was certainly um, a well thought out process uh, with a lot of back and forth. Um, I think it's why our commission looks the way that it does with the eight members that have varying interests. Um, it's why the defendant has to waive all of their rights. That was something that the prosecutors wanted. Um, there's other pieces of the statute, like the turning over of favorable evidence that defense attorneys wanted. Um, so there was a whole lot of uh, talk within that. Um, as to why the General Assembly decided to uh, create the commission, I don't know. I do know that it was a bipartisan effort. It had bipartisan support, um, and it passed easily. Uh, initially, we had a three-year sunset clause on the commission that after three years, they would decide if we were going to stay open or if they were going to shut us down. Thank goodness. <laughs> they decided that uh, we should stay open, um, and they removed that completely um, in 2010. Um, so as to guilty pleas, um, the statute does um, specifically give a different um, voting standard, not standard, but for those who were convicted after a plea of guilty, a unanimous vote is required by the eight commissioners in order to move that case forward, except for those who were um, uh, convicted after a plea of guilty, it's five of eight. So they do have a little bit of a difference there, and I know that that was one of the compromises that was made. Um, there was some thought that the commission shouldn't look at guilty pleas, but that was the compromise that was made in order for the commission to be able to look at guilty pleas. Um, yeah. Well, I, I want to congratulate North Carolina for being in the vanguard and taking some action that probably is long overdue. I think we've come a long way from the days when all defense attorneys assumed that there was a presumption of guilt. And now all of a sudden we are saying, well, we really want to get to the truth. And if it requires a conviction integrity investigation, so be it. And I can't see why this, is a, this concept is not taking hold. And maybe it will moving forward. So my hat is off to you. Thank you. I just had a quick follow-up. Do you think the commission in North Carolina had anything to do with the fact that the most famous wrongful conviction case was Jennifer Thompson, Ronald Cotton? It's probably the most famous case anywhere. It was right before that. Right. I know that that was definitely one of the things that they were looking at um, as they were making those considerations. That case was certainly had a role in that, I believe, yeah. Hi. Um, could... Any of you tell me more about the victims and their uh, unhappiness with regard to when you tell them you're opening these things back up? Um, like, how does it manifest? Uh, what are they mad about, I guess? Because I find it a little bit counterintuitive uh, to be angry about the possibility that the person who was convicted for whatever happened to you is innocent, and so therefore you're mad. So could you just tell me like a little bit more about how that manifests and what it looks like? Yeah, it, I don't know that maybe mad is not the right word, but there, and look, I understand why. And I think that, again, this, this really reinforces why some of these old outdated and uh, identification procedures uh, have to change, show ups, for example. Um, because you know what happens is that that person really believes that they made the identification. So it's not like at the time, you know, just like the prosecutor wasn't setting out to convict somebody innocently, 
that victim wasn't either. And you know, they're caught up in this whole thing and they really truly believe that that person is who, who uh, offended against them. And that's not their fault, that's our fault. You know, our fault as a system when we use these outdated practices. So, um, you know, and that over time, you really sort of, we have found people can kind of dig in and you know, that's, that's what happened. I don't care what the science says, that's the person. And I understand that we don't blame the victims at all. Uh, we do have victim services in our office and then we will, you know, when there's an exoneration that does lead then to a, a cold case investigation to catch the real perpetrator. Um, and, you know, we've had cases where the family is certainly involved in that as well. So they're not always angry. Uh, they're not always upset, uh, but and when they are, you know, I think we all understand why. And that's, again, highlights why these practices have to change. Thank you. Um, and one more question I have for you is, why did the previous state's attorney decline to retest the DNA? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Okay. Wish I could give you an answer, but I don't know. I have a question. Uh, when we're reviewing these type of cases and through CIUs or through your commission, can you tell the crowd how often you come up with situations where a person signs an affidavit 10, five, 10 years later, or a victim recants in an affidavit. Can you guys go through that process for us? Um, when you, like if a victim recants in an affidavit? Yes. So I would say in our office, so that's definitely a sensitive issue, right? We have a victim who maybe has come forward. I think a lot of times the reality of that is Lindsay or I are working um, on those on those cases, and it just depends. It's very case specific on how you handle that or how you deal with that. I don't think it is our instinct, depending on the case. It just this is kind of fact specific to immediately like run out to that victim and be like, "Hey, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, what have you said about this?" I think we're going to look at what else is going on in the case. Um, we do have a case right now. The case is public. It's public record. It's been through a commission hearing. It has not yet gotten to a three-judge panel. This is the Israel Grant case, and that, that was kind of about that issue. We had two victims of a crime. One victim came forward in an affidavit and in later um, talking with folks and said, like, this person did not rob me. Like, this person did not rob me. But the other victim at the time was kind of sticking with it all the way up to you know the commission hearing. We're aware of that. We're aware of the fact that they are victims. You have to be aware of who you're talking to, but I think you also have to balance that still with the need to do the investigation. Um, at the hearing in that case, you can read the transcript. The second victim actually said, hey, listen, this, this guy did not actually rob me. Um, I made it up. So um, the commissioners voted on that case. Um, I think you also, I think we just try to keep in mind and if I have that case in my office, what I'll tell you is I'm gonna look at all the surrounding circumstances before I'm running out to the victim. That's what I'm gonna look at um, first. And then we are just kind of really aware and sensitive to that, and not just victims, but also maybe victims' family members, right? Like you get that a lot too, like hey, you know, sometimes in a small town in North Carolina, the defendant's family and the victim's family are very close. Um, and so, you know, my grandma, who's also her second cousin twice removed, you know, may have heard something. So I mean, like, I think you have to be aware of those relationships and, and we do, we are careful with that in our office for sure. Yeah, we have not yet had a uh, victim um, recant. We've had co-defendant flipper uh, people recant and you know, similarly, we'll look at that in conjunction with everything else. I mean, just like when they initially give their statements, uh, we're, we're very cautious about those statements initially. We're also cautious about them when they recant. But, uh, you know, we look at that in conjunction with everything else. And it's time for one more question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered, those from North Carolina, uh, North Carolina also did some, or made an effort to do some criminal justice reform with their Racial Justice Act, which came back and forth and back, and I think it's gone now, is my understanding. But uh, I wondered how, what your impression of that was from the standpoint of the legislation, legislature, and if you had any blowback yourselves in the innocent side from that experience. 
So I, I probably can't speak to the Racial Justice Act um, at all. It is no longer um, there in North Carolina. We did not see any blowback. Um, we continue to receive support bipartisan support for um, our work. Um, we have been fortunate to not receive cuts to our funding or anything like that. Um, we'll just continue to hope that that, that, that that continues to be the case. North Carolina, though, um, I think has been progressive in other areas as well through bipartisan um, efforts related to just criminal justice reform. I and mean, we had the Justice Reinvestment Act um, several years ago that um, was a bipartisan partisan effort and was uh, easily passed in North Carolina. Um, so, um, you know, for all, all the, the partisan issues that there are in North Carolina, criminal justice reform seems, at least in these couple of instances, to be something that we're able to get together on and, and make some change.